Sweet. I'm Mac, and welcome back to my garage if you're returning. If this is your first time, I replaced the timing chain on this 1970 Plymouth Custom Suburban in an effort to get it running and driving so we could take this and my 1972 Dodge pickup to the Good Guys Car Show in the next couple of weeks. Now, I may or may not have cracked the tubes of the radiator and may or may not have had to get it repaired, but I can say that Performance Radiator here in Phoenix helped out a ton. These guys have been in the valley for over 40 years, and although this is not a sponsor, I like to give credit where it's due, and the radiator repair was reasonably priced and finished sooner than the time frame that they gave me. Also too, while we were checking out the facility, there was a 1971 Dodge Demon in the parking lot. But first, let me provide you with a bit of context. The Dodge Demon had a small two-year run from 1971 to 1972, and was just as much if not more of an appearance package as it could be optioned for performance. Multiple engine options included two variations of Chrysler Slant 6, a 318 or a 340 cubic inch V8. Given its lower price tag of around $2,300 in 1971, you might be surprised to find that only around 10,000 of these were Demon 340 models for the first production year, and even less of them the following in 1972. An extremely rare rendition of the model aimed more towards the all show and no go appearance was a variation known as the Dodge Demon Sizzler. Hood graphics, full carpeting, and padded steering wheel were included at the detriment that the largest motor was the 318. Roughly 1,200 of these Sizzlers were produced, so if you see one, you can appreciate its rarity over desirability. This car is not only a Demon 340, but also a 4 speed car. I'm not versed enough to tell you what's correct and what isn't aside from, say, the tachometer mounted on the steering column or the cup holder consolette box, but if so, it is a very rare car indeed. But the bucket seats with no center console I really enjoy, and nonetheless a very cool Mopar seldom seen today. The of is Dodge this year, you can't afford not to be Dodge material. So I don't expect you guys to see the actual little timing mark that's on the harmonic balancer, but I've got it right around between, I want to say, 5 and 8 degrees before top dead center to be advanced. And then I'm actually looking over at the vacuum gauge here, and we've got it right at about 19, a little more than 19. So it seems to be pretty steady and smooth right here. We're just going to let it run a little bit more now that i got the new radiator cap and it can build pressure. It was leaking just a little bit out the back of the thermostat housing, so I had to tighten that back down. But other than that, it's very smooth now. I could probably balance an open water bottle on the motor and it would not fall off. So I got it to where it's right around 1100 RPM while in park, but while it's under a load and I have it down to drive, it dropped down, I had my dad check for me. It dropped down about 750 around, so that seems to be just fine. But we'll shut it off and I'm gonna clean it up. And unfortunately, I might actually have to redo the gasket around the thermos housing. It just seems to keep leaking. I'm just gonna tighten it down a little bit more, see how much I can get out of it, because I put a decent amount of gasket material, and I'm gonna clean everything up, reassemble it, put the air cleaner back on, and take it around the block and see how she does. Finally out from the garage under its own power in about two weeks. Let's go take it for a little drive. Forgive the shaking of the camera. I can't do anything about it until I get something like a gimbal where I can then stick it to the window. But this should be a treat because I never do POV driving shots in any of my videos, so this will be this will be good. But temp comes up, alternator is doing its job. Just taking it real slow. Already, it just, man, so much more responsive. And it's got a pretty wicked exhaust leak. I know where it is. It's actually coming from where the exhaust manifold on the passenger side bolts up to the exhaust pipe that goes out throughout the underside of the car. 
So I'm just gonna probably buy some cheap exhaust tape or uh, just some metal to try to fix that real fast. Other than that, it, it is going very smooth. Currently on my super top secret filming location in Tijuana, Mexico right now. Because I may or may not have insurance on this thing. I don't know. It's kind of up in the air right now, but I'm just, I have it. I have up in the air insurance. It's, it, it's a new type of insurance, I, I swear. Exhaust the gun, this thing is terrible, but oh well. Oh boy, where do I begin? Well, let's just start from the top, I guess. We finally, <clears throat> I mean, double checked that the vehicle was insured and got a temporary plate from the DMV. On the vehicle's maiden drive, I hadn't realized how much fuel was actually in the car's tank, and it died on me coming home. Go figure. In the meantime, before realizing the fuel filter was bone dry, I also deduced that the vacuum diaphragm in the choke pull-off was shot. Because it couldn't pull the choke blade open at all, the motor was receiving much more fuel than air, hence why it seemed like every time I pulled the plugs out to check them, they were black and extremely soot-covered. I tried finding the choke diaphragm for sale online, but decided on getting a new carburetor entirely because they were relatively cheap and didn't have a stripped screw, which depending on which way you twisted the carb, would warrant a massive vacuum leak from the base plate of the carburetor's body to the intake. My dad brought a gas can and we got the wagon home safely. I ordered the carburetor, and now that I had some time to breathe from the wagon, I decided to do the smart thing and go on a relaxing kayaking expedition around Bartlett Lake. A little sunburn coming back, a couple days to watch paint dry, I got some oil, a filter, and the carburetor in the mail. Just go ahead and maybe move the microphone just a little bit up, further up on the jacket there. So I think the goal, what we're going to try to do is, we're going to get the carburetor on, we're going to have to dial it in with the vacuum gauge, we're going to have to mess again with the idle mixer screws. A early birthday present for myself. Thank you, Mom. Thank you so much. That I had gotten a little camera stabilizer that I can actually suction cup to the window. That way you can kind of do a over the shoulder driving angle so I can actually start doing better driving shots rather than just having the tripod jiggle around on top of the bench seat. And we're just gonna start right in, get out my light. Carburetor is going to be off right now. And it's off. Don't forget your little gasket. There's that goes down first. Just time to reassemble everything. cut myself again oh well simple just siphon some fuel out of the tank try not to get any on your lips and then use this little squirt bottle to get it down into the fuel bowl and that way we should be primed oh hmm the flavor of gasoline ah oh. man a little bit just a little bit left say that so concludes another day. I'm tired, it's late, my phone is at 1% battery life, I haven't eaten yet. Well, it's the next day and uh, there's construction going on out there. It's a gimbal, so I can actually place my phone up against the back window and then kind of look over my shoulder when I'm driving. I need to go up to the auto parts store and I figured may as well have you guys tag along with me.
All right. It's time. Well, it, it would be time if I removed the tire chalk from the back tire. So I'm going to do that first. No power steering is always fun. Also pick up some more brake fluid, get a bigger cord because I still have to bleed the brakes. There's a lot of leaking that's coming out the front bowl of the master cylinder. And I gotta get this fuel gauge working as well. I bet you in the time that I've just sat here for the last for the last 15 seconds. I bet you there's a little quart of oil right now on the ground. I mean, that that's how quickly it was leaking out. And when I moved the wagon back this morning, just to start on working on the carburetor, getting everything dialed in, there was a massive puddle of oil. And luckily I hadn't moved the carpet up, so it just got onto the floor and I was able to brake clean it and wipe it. But I mean, aside from the wicked exhaust leak it has on the uh, passenger side, it seems to be doing just fine. It goes down the road nice and smooth, could definitely use some suspension. Yeah, I just basically lost all front brakes. I got nothing. Got no brakes up front whatsoever. The pedal goes all the way to the floor. Coming out of the auto parts store, I ordered a new master cylinder, stocked up on brake fluid, and a new nylon washer for the oil pan bolt. Oh, and I have to resort to this voiceover audio. For some reason, the microphone kept shifting between my phone and the microphone clipped to my shirt. I hadn't been in the store for two minutes, and the leak had already created a small 10W30 puddle under the car. Oh well. I ended up fixing the leak and waiting another day before the master cylinder arrived. What? Hmm? No, are you insane? I'm not reusing the same driving footage but sped up to mimic the drive home. Pfft. What do you think I am? Max Garage or something? So with everything set up, we are now ready to pour fluid into both bowls and begin the process of bench bleeding the master cylinder. You want to make sure that both of the tubes on the clip are facing downwards and will be submerged underneath the brake fluid. But we'll pour some brake fluid into both of the bowls. Once you have both of the bowls filled like we do here, you can begin by taking a hopefully rounded off object. They do make special tools that have a ball end, and that way you're not going to be damaging the bore of the piston itself. But what I'm going to be doing is using the alternative, which is just simply a star bit screwdriver with a rag wrapped around it. And so now you're just going to take the end and you're going to start compressing the piston. And you want to do long drawn out pumps of the piston as well as short rapid ones to try to work out all of the air bubbles. As you continue to work more air bubbles out through the piston and then up through the lines, you're going to find that pressing it in is going to be a little bit more challenging, it's going to be a little bit tougher each time as more of the fluid is drawn down. Now you will get pockets of a cluster of bubbles that form up in the tube and I would say the best practice is to try to push the piston in release them down so they don't just move back up to the top end of the hose, get them into the bowl and then let them dissipate. Don't just keep pushing it, otherwise you're gonna suck them right back down and just keep recycling them and recycling them through. So just wait for them to dissipate in each of the bowls respectively and then continue again to push in the piston to get more and more of that out until it, you reach a point where I would say pretty much we're very, very close. There's a little bit more that I'm gonna try to work out, but for the most part, the liquid in the tubes is clear. So we're now going to turn our attention to the master cylinder that we're gonna be taking off. This is the old one. What was interesting was there were a couple different styles and me being as purist as I am, I was trying to look for something that most accurately looked like what came from the factory. 
I do not know if this is the original master cylinder or not, but I believe, at least from most of the engine bay photos I've seen of other Plymouths, the C-body from this era, specifically 1970, they have that flat style cap on the new master cylinder with the single bolt that holds it down and retains it. Is hopefully I will not be stripping out these lines. There's a 9 16 for both of them. Wow, okay. That one was pretty easy. Looking underneath the car, the soft lines that run from the end of the hard line from the control arm down to the actual drum hub itself. They all seem to be relatively new, which is a good sign. And I don't see any leaking from any of the drums, but it doesn't ever hurt to pull off each of the drums by themselves and check the dust caps on the wheel cylinders to make sure that they are not leaking themselves. I'm kind of running out of time in order to delegate certain projects on this car before the car show. And so I think once we get the master cylinder, at least it will give us adequate enough pedal pressure to be able to brake and to just slowly cruise around town to get it ready for the Good Guys Car Show. So we're just gonna do a quick jump cut and have the master cylinder in. So another day has actually gone by. I was able to finish putting on the new master cylinder the previous night and it was just late enough to where my phone had actually died and I was extremely tired. So another day passed. I actually drove the wagon to work. Brandon drove just fine and the brake pressure was awesome. So the following day, I was able to pick up all of the pieces I had redone for the interior of my Dodge truck. It worked out given that I could use the wagon to neatly shuttle all of the pieces home safely without risk of bumping into one another given how much space is in the back of this thing. But I cannot talk about these pieces without mentioning the man behind them. Matt with ARC did a beautiful job of recreating the color and textures on the armrests, the door panels, the steering column shroud, and even removing cracks from the vinyl surface of the glove box door. He followed up all of the pieces with a light gloss to give me the desired appearance of applied plastic protectant without the greasy surface touch. These pieces, as thankful as I am that they're present with the truck, are all but impossible to find. No aftermarket replicas are available for any, I repeat, any of these pieces. So with Matt having spent the time and effort in recreating their factory fresh look, he's helped me to preserve pieces of automotive history that I can now have ready for the car show. Speaking of which, as I sit here editing this video tirelessly on the computer, I think I've got a business card lying around. Again, not a paid sponsor, but you've got to give credit where it's due. If you're local to the Scottsdale Phoenix area and in need of the following automotive treatment, leather repair, vinyl repair, plastic repair, cloth repair, carpet repair, control button refinishing, leather dye, vinyl dye, plastic dye, or carpet dye, whew, that's a lot to mention. Give ARC a call. I'll leave a link to their website in the description of this video. And thank you again to Matt. So we've successfully installed the interior back into the truck. I'm really, really happy with how it turned out and so glad that I was able to get it done in time. Thank you again to Matt for being able to push it to the deadline of getting it ready for the Good Guys Car Show this year. That's gonna do it for this video. Leave a comment down below telling me what you liked about the video or what you didn't like about the video, no matter the case. Tell me down in the comments below. Also, please consider subscribing to the channel as I greatly enjoy formatting these videos and putting them together and I hope that you enjoyed. Until next time, take care.